think the main character of this movie is supposed to be? 76. <laughs> because that's how old he appears to me. I mean, no, he probably is trying to play a, like, late 30, early 40 year I was going to say early 30. He looks 76, but I think in his mind he's pulling off early 30s. It's like that 30 Rock Steve Buscemi meme where he goes undercover in a high school. Hello, fellow kids. <laughs> <laughs> I love Steve Buscemi, and I feel like that's a pretty apt sort of comparison here. Um, John DeHart does not pull off early 30s. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I love what you've tried to put together here, John, but you're just not pulling it off. John DeHart doesn't pull off anything. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, no. Uh, no. Welcome to Bad Movies and Beer. I'm Cooper. Oh, and I'm Nolan. And today we are discussing Champagne and Bullets, a.k.a. Road to Revenge, a.k.a. The Get Even. So you know when a movie has a trillion titles that we're in for something special. Yeah, it's usually not a good sign, right? Not of a good movie. No. Usually when you have a ton of titles, it means that you've pitched this movie and it's got turned down, and so you've renamed it and tried to pitch it again. Or it's been released many times as like a cash grab. Like, what's a title we can use to get people to like rent this DVD or whatever? Did this get Listen released up. to DVD? I think it only got released to DVD. <laughs> I don't think this thing was in theaters. <laughs> but uh, either way, it has been brought to our attention by one of our Instagram followers. I wouldn't call this a request per se, more of a suggestion. Back when I posted one of my many, many Vinegar Syndrome stacks after a Vinegar Syndrome purchase, one of our Instagram followers, I am Hash Brown, suggested that we should watch this while enjoying Miller High Life and Bullet Bourbon. And uh, as someone who loves Miller High Life, you did not have to twist my arm on that half of the equation. How do you feel about Bullet Bourbon, though? Less strong. I feel less good about it, but, you know. <laughs> hey, we got to that fucking scotch for Caddyshack, too. We can at least enjoy a Ooh, little bullet. That Tomatin was delicious, and thank you for our friend Brad for bringing that. Well, thank you to I Am Hash Brown for suggesting this lovely concoction of champagne and bullets. I personally was hoping we'd be able to incorporate some kind of, like, traditional beer macro brews into this. You were against that from the beginning. I love that I've managed to backdoor it here from this Instagram request. Are you just, like, furious right now on a scale of 1 to 10? I'm mostly furious because you're insinuating that this is against my ethos rather than you've had me drinking. Oh, don't Miller come High in here ages. and play the common yeah. man when it uh, comes to beer stuff. Uh, man, you, I, fucking... you know I have been taking Boilermakers down for decades, and I'm happy to do this. Um... They even incorporate a Boilermaker into this movie, so it's a pretty nice connection. Easy. Also a lot of champagne, yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of yeah. champagne, so easy, easy connections here. Not a hard fit. Uh, I think this is going to be easier to swallow than watching the film, so this will be good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any history for the folks on uh, Miller Brewery? You don't really do <laughs> No, I didn't do any research on I think they advertise for themselves, so I didn't need to do that. I mean, I know that they're out of Milwaukee, and uh, we've had some good Miller beers in Milwaukee in the past, so I'm not opposed to drinking this, but I'm not going to advertise for them. I think they do that on their own. They're good. This is literally my favorite beer. Until recently, you were not able to get the classic Miller High Life clear bottle in Canada, but fortunately, that's been a recent change, so we're going to enjoy those for sure. What are we wasting time talking about? Let's get into it, man. Yeah, Come let's on. get into it. I think I'm going to need this alcohol for me to get through talking about this movie, so this will be great. So negative. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> we're going to do the drop sound? Yeah, we're going to drop this in and we're going to chug it, right? That's how you do it. Here we go. Cheers, brother. Slasha. So we start things off with some world-class B-movie music and graphics that tell us that Monarch Productions presents Champagne and Bullets. Drinking champagne and loving you until the break of dawn. <laughs> the soundtrack of this movie <laughs> is just incredible. Well, the best part about the soundtrack of this movie is that it is sung by our director, by our actor, by our producer, John DeHart. The man is multi-talented. What do they call that in the industry when you have multiple talents here? You're a triple threat. Yeah, he's bringing the triple threat here. He is the writer, director, actor, singer. Shit, it's a quadruple threat. We've watched a couple movies already. Miami Connection, YK Kim did fucking everything. We talked about uh, Human Tornado, Rudy Ray Moore. 
I would have him as a distance third, I think, behind those two. <laughs> so, but he's clearly, he, this is his vision, and he is carrying it from start to finish. Yeah, this is the same vein as those things. We've talked a little bit about watching a Neil Breen movie. I think he's kind of famous in the BC movie community. We're going to get, we've talked about this so much, but we have to do a Neil Breen movie, and we're going to fucking do it in the future. Yeah, and, and this kind of feels like that to me. It falls in line with all of those. I don't know where to put him in terms of the others, I think at the end of this, we're going to have to discuss where he fits. You're calling He's him third. number third right yes. now. <laughs> Jesus. I would like to make some arguments at the end of this film that maybe he's doing some things better than those other two you talked about. Not than Rui Ray Moore. I might give you YK Kim. We'll talk about it. We'll get, yeah, we'll it get the there. We'll get there. Uh, we faded on the LAPD staking out a cabin in the California woods. The extremely gravelly voiced leader, Officer Normad, there's a normal human name, he likes what he sees, but they don't have a warrant. But if you think that's going to stop these cops from administering justice, you're wrong. Yeah, fuck that. Why wait for proper procedures here? I'm a little confused because Normad seems to be leading the show, and I'm wondering whether he's the one who's sort of going to lead us into this film, if that's the producer, because he's telling everyone what to do, but he starts giving some bad advice here. He sends his two other guys in to flank, and then he tells the bad guys that they're there. Yeah, he's dirty, and it, this all predictably goes sideways. One of the other cops, Wings Hauser, is the actor playing him, gets shot in the stomach, and the dirtbags doing coke all get mowed down. But when the dust settles, Normad is thrilled with the outcome of this, even when John DeHart knees him in the dick. Big mistake. <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling to understand what's happening. We're only about three minutes I'll in. get used to that feeling. That's going to happen. <laughs> We've had a theme song from the writer, director, actor... And then we've seen what I thought was the main character get kneed in the d*** by another character. And we know things are about to go south. We transition into about a 30-minute court scene. God, yeah, man. There are so many scenes in this movie that go so long. And I have my theories on why that is. One year later is the scene we cut to. Normad is facing an internal affairs hearing over this unwarranted operation. Literally, it's unwarranted. He sells out the other two officers, and despite him wearing a jacket that's about three sizes too big and clearly being the biggest dirtbag on planet Earth, they appear to believe Officer Normad. And like you said, this scene takes about 10 minutes, not 30, but that's still about 10 minutes too long. This is just never-ending. It's moving so slow. The acting is atrocious. The setting is awful. It's the most basic court you've ever seen. The judge is clearly not a judge. Normad can't act, but he's somehow thrown these two under the bus. And it turns out that instead of Normad getting in trouble, the other two are kicked off the force. Yeah, it's not court. It's an internal like investigation. There's no judge. It's just the one of the, like, the higher up police officers. Doing okay, it. yeah, he seems like it's but it's set up like a courtroom. Essentially, like they're on trial here. And yes, as you mentioned, those two officers 100 percent lose their jobs. When we see them again in the future, they are now working private security gigs or as limo drivers? I wasn't totally clear on this. It's a weird mix because one of them is shooting a crossbow and the other has a shotgun. They're drinking Miller, high, uh, not High Life, unfortunately. Miller Light. It would have been close. sweet if we were it was very Miller close, High Life. Yeah. That would have been awesome. Um, and they're discussing, yeah, their future. One of them's like, I got a gig tonight, and I'm going to go drive around some teens it's a for prom. their prom. Yeah. Yeah, and we get this really cheesy scene of him in the limo and then some drunk teens. The girl is somehow losing her dress and flashing her tits, and the boys are being inappropriate. Definitely, but even the scene leading up to this where they're talking about what's going on, I am completely lost. Like, we're seven minutes in, and this movie is totally off the rails. The transitions are confusing. The music they're using is completely bizarre. And I have no idea what's happening here. But, like you said, we know the one guy's driving a limo with some kids in it. He ditches them at the beach. Adios, you Bill Lugosi. And the, <laughs> his, his friend, <laughs> the other cop is, like, ironing his pants in a cowboy outfit, watching TV while a Native American mannequin rests on the couch. What is <laughs> happening here? <laughs> Things are fucking batshit already. Like, I am really struggling with where we are. There's not enough explanation, yet these scenes are way too long. The one guy, Hauser, is wearing the cowboy hat, and he is ironing his pants. Sorry, his character's name, I'll jump in here, is Huck Finney. Yes, and you know what's even worse is that they're going to make reference to the literary character, and it's going to be inspiration for the character later you didn't like that eh it was really confusing and okay. like out of nowhere i thought you were against the racist parts of that story i mean it was a different time 
I don't know if they were racist in so much as they were like the inspired name of the character by character is N word Jim. Yeah, well that is a problem for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but they use they use the Jim character as inspiration for doing good things in this movie, I so guess. So why has he got a fucking American Indian mannequin on his There's uh... so much problematic shit in this that we're not even gonna get into this. Don't try to goad me into I'm being your woke friend right you. now. You can fuck yourself. You are because, my woke friend. Oh, uh, easy now. <laughs> we we have a lot more problems to deal with in this because these two are getting their gear on. It's t-shirt time. They are about to head to the bar. It's not t-shirt time. It's cowboy night at the bar. That's why he's wearing the hat and the shirt with the fucking designs. And, you know, he's ironing. I, I agree. I just cowboy pants. I, it felt like the start of a Jersey Shore episode to me. This is why I had to throw back to that. They were. Fuck, maybe in about 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> the average age of this crew is like 57. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they head to the bar for Cowboy Day, and they spot some ladies. The older guy, uh, this is John DeHart. Rick is his character's name. One of them is his old flame, Cindy, and he kind of reconnects with her at the bar in a scene that is absolutely one of the bottom three scenes I've ever seen in terms of acting. <laughs> It is so bad, it's almost unbelievable. So there's three women around the bar. One of them is Cindy. One of them is the most leather-skinned woman I've ever seen in my entire Fuck, life. Fuck, man, she's an old hag. And I'm not trying to judge her, like, no, no judgment, but she is weathered. She looks like I feel right now on the inside. Oh, she has seen a lot in life. Like, she is someone who's seen a lot. And then there's another woman there, and... The three of them make way so that Rick and Cindy can kind of reconnect. I'm confused because I'm pretty sure Rick comes in and says something about, like, dating her mother. Like, I felt like, what? yeah, what? I thought that Rick was dating her mother. In terms of age rating, he is clearly a generation older than her. He looks like her dad. Absolutely, he does. He looks older than her dad in this film. He looks like everyone's dad. <laughs> this is not everyone's the leading old star dad. of an action movie What's franchise. What's hilarious here is they so sort of do a reconnect. They start loving each other. Uh, or, like, talking about where they've been through. And he's like, I know what the, will make this better. I'm going to go sing you a song. Hang on now. He's requested to come sing a song by the bar owner. They call Rick up on stage to perform his favorite song with the local house band. And he does it, somehow exhibiting even less charisma than he has in conversation. And I want to give you credit for noticing this. This is where you realize that he is absolutely the guy who sang the opening theme to this movie. Yeah, it's pretty quick here when he starts performing that I'm like, this is the guy who sung the song at the start. You fucking nailed it. And Good we're going to get more of it. Like, I can tell that this is we're gonna not get more. It's a never-ending deluge of it. It's all the time. It's it's fantastic. I love DeHart's balls here. The fact that he's willing to insert himself both as the acting talent and the musical talent of this film is fucking fantastic. We get into the shimmy slide performance here, and... I'm going to throw it out here. This song is kind of catchy. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> I felt the same way. Listen, I, his performance is atrocious. He's barely moving. Just statuesque. He is kind of gently shimmying from side to side. <laughs> well, that's just his old age. That's his, like, yeah, he's just shaking. He's trying to with, make a yeah, he's just, he's, yeah. yeah, he's trying to hold on to stability with his age, and he's doing a bit of shaking, and it's a little Fuck, bit man. rough. Um, a little bit rough. It's really rough, but yeah. the song is catchy in terms of oddly its lyrics. Catchy. Yeah, oddly catchy. He's kind of like a like a, a weathered American Leonard Cohen. I did make some connections to Leonard yeah. Cohen. You, you see that there? I think he's Leather Cohen. <laughs> So he's performing, and I'm strangely enjoying it. Like, I don't understand why yeah. I like it. I wrote What the Fuck and Oh My God in the biggest, like, characters in my, like, notes that I have done yeah. ever. He has dead eyes and no charisma. Oh, God, yeah. He, his eye is terrible. He's staring right at you, too. Yeah. He stares dead center at the screen. It's like wherever you go in the room, he follows you, and it's haunting. He's kind of seeing into my soul, and I'm having trouble with it. Like... It's strangely enjoyable, but also something that I'm not comfortable with. And somehow this is getting Cindy fucking hot. I get it, man. When you were describing it a second ago, it's like when you get an erection watching someone die. It's, you know, it's very... <laughs> 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 
it's it's disturbing. Like you don't feel good about it, but it's happening. I just choked all of my beer all over myself right there. <laughs> so listen, while Rick is up there gently shimmying from side to side, a gang of toughs enters the bar and starts harassing Cindy. She brushes them off, but we know this is going to be trouble later. Now, if Rick notices, he doesn't let on. He just finishes up the song and heads back to the bar, which allows the next performer to hit the stage. And this bar is like a strip club or I don't really know. Like some, some lady goes up there and just pops him out, which Rick and his lady both seem to enjoy. Fun, huh? Good, on, good show. And he's not wrong. <laughs> this is insane. Rick puts on this performance <laughs> that makes the floor soggy. All of the women are all about this. They're super into it, especially Cindy. So much so that a woman comes out after him and takes off her top and dances around in a thong. So some prude of the bar calls the cops, and this is probably good because these toughs are about to get into it with Rick. Yeah, but actually it's kind of a case of bad timing because we do get a good old-fashioned bar brawl with, by the way, some of the most ridiculous sound effects you'll ever find on a film. This suddenly turns into a 70s kung fu movie, and I'm kind of here for it. Like, honestly, I love these effects. Oh, my God, you love the effects? I struggled so hard with when they went to punch each other. They were seven feet away, and then they heard the sound, and then they fell. It sounded like someone hitting, like, two wood blocks together. It was great shit. Uh, The cops do show up, and they happen to grab Wingshauser, Rick's BFF, Huck, because they walk in right as he's knocking some dude out and then pouring a beer on him, which this guy thought was a nice touch. So now Rick's going to have to bail him out of jail. Uh, He'll have some help, though, as we meet alleged bail bondsman Mo in yet another scene that takes forever. This movie is exactly 90 minutes long, and they are fucking grinding to make it there. I would say, like, 70% of the scenes were longer than I wanted them to be. There was 30% of the scenes, most of them involving a naked Cindy, that could have gone on just a slight amount longer, but the rest of them <laughs> were complaining about those were, ones. were way, way too long. I thought for sure this Mo character was going to end up being dirty. Like, it ended in a way that's really indicating that he'd be something big, and he's just nobody. We never see him again. There's no fallout from this. No, he just showed up to help bail out. He's Huck, one of John DeHart's friends, and he's like, yeah, I'll write you a part. Absolutely, he was. I mean, he maybe, I would say, produced the keyboard lines in this movie, and that's what brought him That in. was most job. Yeah, that was most regular know, job. This bullet bourbon and Miller High Life are going down just remarkably smooth. Listen, I crushed that Boilermaker. My uh, fucking bullet's already gone. I'm just on to the Miller High Life. I feel good about it. Yeah, well, this is this is moving smoothly, just like Rick in a room full of women. Well, listen, appropriately enough, the next time we see Rick, he's out for dinner with Cindy, and he's charming the owner of this fucking restaurant with his hilarious jokes while toasting what is, to them, a very special occasion to us. I I don't understand this restaurant scene. It doesn't really make any sense. We throw out some pretty bad jokes, and then we transition immediately into a scene with Cindy and Rick on a swing. The dress that Cindy is wearing is hot fire, (laughs) and Rick is uh, old. That's pretty much (laughs) where we are right now. Yeah, I will say, the scene in the restaurant is the one that confirmed it for me. The guy playing Rick, who, as we already mentioned, is also the writer and director of this piece of shit, he has zero charisma. In fact, he he has less than zero charisma. He has negative charisma. He makes everyone else around him have less charisma. But let's be clear here. It's not like Cindy is fucking Meryl Streep, as we see in this scene you're talking about. Well, you say that he has negative charisma, and I do agree that this guy is bringing no acting chops. But I think that he makes Cindy stand out. She pops in his presence. Do you know she used to be in a cult? (laughs) Well, we're about to find out because they're hanging out on a swing and they're going to recollect the time where the cult murdered a baby in front of her. <laughs> you're I'm laughing sorry. at I'm this. Yeah, you're I'm laughing not, at the murdered I'm baby. Laughing. I'm laughing. But holy bad this shit, this no, is insane. Listen, we flash back to the scene she mentions at the satanic cult meeting or whatever. And wouldn't you know it, every bad character we've met so far is part of this cult. Fucking Normad, the dirty cop, is running the meeting. And those four guys from the bar are there, too, about to sacrifice a baby like you mentioned. And Cindy cannot handle it. So they bind in Gagger. And what happens to the baby? So we get some of the worst attempted murder scenes I've ever seen. We get stabbing of pillows and other things. Nothing close to the baby, even remotely. Okay, sorry. Are, are you saying you would have preferred if they had literally stabbed the baby? No, absolutely. In real life, I wouldn't like a baby to be murdered. But I would like you to make you it You wanted an incredible real. baby murder yeah, scene. If you're yeah. going to make a satanic cult, I had a lot of problems with them 
making all of the evil characters a part of a satanic cult coven. Well, they keep saying coven. I don't think coven is the correct term. It is not because that's coordinated with like witchcraft. They had no idea what they were talking about. There's no just, witchcraft. These guys just love yeah, Satan. And they took everything out of what they thought was evil and made it the evil characters. This is my problem. I think that DeHart should have stuck with writing songs and stayed away from writing plots because he's really fucked this up. Just put an album up, man. Don't do a movie. You don't oh need a movie. Oh, my God. Would you bone down to a DeHart John album? John DeHart's greatest hits? Oh, I'm my going God. To. Yeah, is he I on hope Spotify? So. If I can find it, I will put it on in the background. You bet your life on it. This scene is also way too long for the record. But when we cut back to the president, Cindy giving her monologue. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I tried to stop it, but I couldn't. So I just left Hollywood the next day. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I actually kind of wish we were back there. Like, I would prefer watching more Baby Sacrifice than this fucking acting. At this point in my notes, I wrote down, is this the worst movie I have ever seen in my life? The only thing I would say is that this has just a fire soundtrack comparatively. <laughs> <laughs> the John DeHart soundtrack. Bring it home. Hey, did you know that uh, Rick isn't just an ex-cop? He's an aspiring actor? This 100% maybe Google, was John DeHart a police officer? I think this is just his life story, and he is paying to tell it on the screen. Was he a cop? I don't, I don't know. I well, you know. Googled it, and you I didn't find I the answer? I not find an answer. No one knows. Google doesn't know who John DeHart is. I'm not sure that John DeHart finished fourth grade. <laughs> Like, this is where we're at right now. I'm pretty sure that based on the plot I have understood here and the things that are being put out, John DeHart did not finish the fourth grade. Well, <laughs> well either way, with that out of the way, they toast again that night in front of the fire to new beginnings. May they never end. Which, does that make sense? Also, are they also performing this song as well? Where yes. are we yes. right now? So... We transitioned from Cindy character telling us about her being in a cult and him sort of talking about him as an ex-cop. And then we're in front of a fire. We get some flaming log effects. And there is a song in the background that the two of them are singing as they decide to fucking bone down. I feel like we discussed this in a previous episode. But, like, would you get down to a song that you yourself are singing? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I, I actually... I think this is the greatest value of this entire movie. You mentioned that earlier. Like, and I am not arguing with you for like the record. Several I, times I yeah. think that John DeHart has something here. If you can create the soundtrack to your own f***ing, you have achieved something. <laughs> like you, you have made yourself a person on the map. I'm just going to put this out there. Possible album title. I think this is a slam dunk. DeHart to Heart. <laughs> <laughs> To heart, to heart. That's yeah. good, right? It's pretty good. Um, I if think you are John good. DeHart or the estate of John DeHart, if he's dead, and you want to release his <laughs> album, please contact us. Please We're make happy a John DeHart album and release it on Spotify uh, because yeah. we are going to fucking listen to For it. the record, I would love to sing backup vocals on a John DeHart album. That would be amazing. What, <laughs> all right. We're getting way out of the field here. What I really liked about this scene was how tentative he seemed as a lover. Like, it appeared like he had no idea what to do with her. He settled on, grab an ice cube and let's get those nipples really hard. Speaking of really hard, what would you think of this scene? <laughs> as yeah. a 75-year-old man, I would assume he had more moves than he brought to the table here. Okay, but think about that, though. This movie was like 1992, 3. If he's 75, that means like he became he went sexually through the active 40s in like and the shit. 40s. Yeah, yeah, you're you're like, they... yeah, you're not doing a lot of dirty stuff in the 40s, right? You're just surviving Your move the war. Is like, you know... In, I, out. I kissed her. In, out. And yeah. I touched her arm. I peeled off her culottes at the fucking <laughs> Memorial Day celebration. Like, come on. So, so it did seem like there was more to be brought to the table here. He ran the ice over her body and then her nipples. And then we kind of transitioned out of this. I wish we got a little more. And you know what? The thing that I like about this movie is it does fulfill that later. We've had so many movies this year where you've been like, I wish there was more nudity, and this is really feeding into that. I would say the majority of my enjoyability rating from this film is going to come from the f***ing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, self-soundtrack to f***ing is also A++ for me. I think it's appealing anyway you slice it. From there, we head back to the bar where a very drunk Rick tells his very drunk friends to congratulate him because he and Cindy are back together. His friends seem unimpressed. They even turned on his request to recite Hamlet, which popped me. 
Uh, it did not. <laughs> <laughs> this scene is actually pretty funny. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> it did not pop his BFF Wings Hauser, though, who rips into the other guys at the bar for being fringe discount friends. But in his defense, it sounds like he's kind of going through some stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, we know Hauser's going through a lot. I think it's hilarious that they bring up this fringe friends thing because I think that is a real thing. I think that everybody has kind of a group of friends who are real friends. And then others who kind of are on the outside, and we only keep them around when we need a discount for a certain number of people who are there. <laughs> well, sure enough, in the next scene, we see Wingshauser shooting holes in his overdue bills with a tiny gun and flushing them down the toilet. Will anything pull him out of this spiral? I'll tell you what won't do it. A visit from his ex-wife who is there to collect her alimony. This was depressing as fuck, but at least we got to see some fucking acting. This scene was really rough for me. He was drunk and passed out on the couch. And I think Huck here, our Hauser character, best actor in the movie, is probably the best actor. I hundred percent. Yeah, he's way too overboard most of the time. But this scene where he tells her like to go fuck herself, basically because he knows she's fucking other guys and she doesn't actually need the money, and he has none of it because he's been oh, he's fired. broke as fuck. Yeah, yeah. But you're right; it kind of goes badly for a Huck character though, because she calls the cops and then pretends to be abused by him. Oh God, that's my favorite part of the scene. She fires up on him by ripping her tits out, and she's like, "You remember these? You didn't know how to treat them either." God damn. Poor Huck. <laughs> Poor fucking Huck didn't know what to do with the breast. She pulls him out and calls the cops and tells him that she he abused her and that he had no idea what to do with him. Okay, but wouldn't these cops know him? He's not that far removed from being the cop. Wouldn't they show up and be like, oh, Huck, how are you? They didn't. He told them that he was an ex-cop and they didn't care, so they bring him in and put him in jail. Well, uh, also, as we learn in the next scene, she's also involved with those Satanists. Yeah, she is starting to see, I guess, the leader of that, Normad, the guy we saw at the very first scene in the movie. And Normad's pissed at her. What does he make her do? Oh, well, yeah, man. She's a bad girl. So Normad's going to have to give her a spanking. And this scene would be super uncomfortable if his hands were getting anywhere close to her ass. Instead, what we get is a master class in bad acting and even worse set design. There is nothing on the walls here. They are cutting costs all over the place. What was weird to me was he wanted to spank her, and to do so, he pulled down her thong. Her thong hid zero of her ass. He could have spanked her rightfully with it on, but instead he slid it down three inches and spanked her ass cheek despite that. Yeah, I don't know exactly what pulling it down does here, but he seems to do it. Maybe it's a symbolic gesture. It was definitely symbolic because it did not change anything that happened. He spanks her. I thought there might be like a uncomfortable sex scene or some kind of power dynamic here. You thought he was going to rape her, just say it. I did think he was going to rape her. It did seem like it ended with him forcing her to give him oral sex, though. Oh, she bleeps him 100%. But again, this to me just screams cost-cutting measure. Uh, you know how else they cut costs? By making fucking Normad whatever character they need him to be. Corrupt cop? Sure. Leader of a state cult? Absolutely. Judge in Wings Hauser's trial? Why not? <laughs> This makes no sense. <laughs> this transition is insane. He goes from getting blown by the ex-wife of Hauser to being the judge in the trial, which is bonkers. Um, the trial goes on as you would expect, and Hauser gets fucking dumped for it because, of course, Nomad is going to give him the maximum sentence. Yeah, but even if he had somehow managed to transition from narcotics police officer to judge in the last 18 months, he'd never be able to hear this case because of their prior relationship. He'd have to excuse himself. Luckily, Rick is there to point this out to that lawyer. Listen, you polyester puppet. All right, slow down. What are you talking about? Huck and Nomad were on the police force together. Nomad never liked Huck. He can't be the judge. It's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed harder than any other moment in this movie when he called that lawyer a polyester puppet. That is definitely something that needs to be pulled out more often. If you are listening right now and you have an opportunity to call someone a polyester puppet, fucking do it. Because yeah, if you're, if you're currently involved in litigation, go ahead and call your lawyer. <laughs> Listen, Rick's effort here... It's noble, but it's too little too late, as Huck tries to off himself by drinking bleach in jail. This doesn't work, though, and he ends up getting some counsel from the oddly robotic Sister Mary in the hospital. 
We are getting a lot of Wings Hauser in the last half hour or so, and I almost wonder if John DeHart got a look at himself on the screen and was like, maybe we need more Wings Hauser scenes. <laughs> Wings Hauser does carry a lot of the acting. At least Wings brings the, like, emotion that's necessary. The problem with the Wings Hauser character is we're not getting enough f***ing or other things along with it. He's in such a desperate place that we're not getting the good stuff. Now, I know when that nun came in, you kind of got you were like, this nun is kind of sexy for what she should be bringing. I mean, listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you she wasn't an attractive nun, but regardless, we get another John DeHart scene now as he heads to Cindy's parents' house to help her move out. Her dad is unreceptive to his presence. Side note, I don't blame him. The guy's wearing leather pants in the fucking Los Angeles heat but it is <laughs> so <laughs> I got to pull back to this because I got to stop you. Rick wears leather pants a lot in this movie. I don't know why John DeHart thought that was a good fucking costume design option, but he likes putting himself in leather pants. He likes fucking ball sweat is what he likes. This must be hot as fuck. I agree. The father of the Cindy character is younger than John DeHart. Yes, yeah, very possible. He's absolutely younger than yeah. John DeHart. Uh, in a totally organic aside, Cindy explains to Rick that her family has differences that, as she puts it, are irreconcilable, and it really, really feels like she is using that word for the first time. Oh my god, I laughed so hard when she said it because she had no idea what it meant, and I still believe that both her and John are at a fourth grade education level. I mean, listen, this scene is overly long, like so many others, and I'm very sure they only brought in the actor playing Cindy's dad to make John DeHart's acting seem better, but they really get into it here. And speaking of getting into it, after they pull away in his Jeep, we cut to a silhouette of what looks like Rick f***ing Cindy in her lawn chair. <laughs> oh you can't convince God. me that's what's happening here. There, we have about a 10-minute scene where there's a sunset, and they're sitting there, and it's way too long. Like Every if scene is yeah, too long. It is way too long. The song is playing in the background, and we're trying to get a commentary on whether their love is coming together. Clearly it is. Because we're going to transition from this, like, sunset jeep scene to them just straight f***ing in a tub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. From there, we cut to an extremely erotic sex scene in a bathtub featuring more champagne and her just riding his c for what is literally seven minutes. Like, this sex scene lasts so long, it could have conceivably been an actual sex scene. It's fairly glorious. The Cindy performer and actress is really good. I mean, there's a lot of fake orgasm faces from her, but the rest of it is quite well done. Our DeHart performer, writer, singer, director is not bringing a lot of emotion and or sexuality to most of this stuff. She is really earning her paycheck, and I feel like DeHart had to pay her more for this because this whole But how scene, much more? I don't know. I don't know how much she got paid. I don't know how much this whole thing costs. I would say that this scene alone is worth 40% of her paycheck. Oh, she's worth every penny. 40% of her paycheck yeah. should have went to this scene. And she's <laughs> in a lot of the movie because she fucking dominates in this scene. It's a star-making vehicle for her. You're saying. Yeah, that's. I wish it was. Like, if she went on to have a successful porn career, I would not be surprised because... Oh, my God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, where would this go? This is not going anywhere other than that. We don't see insertion, but we see the rest of her, and she does a good job of faking an orgasm on a 75-year-old d*** <laughs> and riding around in a wet, soapy pool for, for, for at least seven minutes of this film. And I would say that most of the audience would enjoy this seven minutes more than any other time invested in this film. Best scene in the movie, you're saying? Absolutely. I, I, I don't even think it's debatable. I think if you if you threw it out there and said, what's the best scene in this entire movie? I would say 99.5% of people would choose this one. And I would say 99.5% of those people would be pervs. <laughs> Just fucking pervs out. Anyway, we cut from that to what I think is a dream sequence. I'm not no, really sure, no, though. No, no, it's not. No? There's, no, the, there's no dream sequences in this entire movie. <laughs> Huck is in his pool, a.k.a. Huck's Haven, pacing back and forth, ranting and raving about Huckleberry Finn and the Bible, I guess. He's wearing nothing but denim. Half of his hair appears to be dyed orange, <laughs> and he's also got two topless women sunning on pool floaties. Is this real? And if so, these women are definitely prostitutes, right? It's definitely real. 
they went to the dollar store and they bought a piece of Bristol board and put like <laughs> Cox Haven. Both the women in his pool also have half orange hair and something's happened to Huck. This is the scene where he gets into that weird like racist slash non-racist diatribe about Huckleberry Finn. He's holding up well. He's doing <laughs> Well, <laughs> Huck is having, I don't know if he's holding up well. It's a mess. Rick stops by to invite him to the wedding. He and Sydney are getting married. Apparently it's happening the next day. She's in a classic white dress, and he's wearing a fucking tracksuit. But they lock this thing in, which leads us to another deeply erotic sex scene. She does a seductive strip tease, then mounts him. But he decides to actually do some fucking work here and gets on top of her. He's thrusting steadily and rubbing his mustache all over her naked body. It's somehow less appealing than I'm making it sound, despite all the nudity. Are you happy this is what you wanted? Send it in. Just fucking send it (laughs) in is what we're getting right now. I'm loving this. So this wedding came out of nowhere, and the honeymoon scene is fantastic. Her fucking striptease of him is probably the sexiest thing I've seen in a movie in the last five years. Him trying to perform on top of her is pathetic and sad, and we all feel like, oh, my God. (laughs) Pathetic and sad. DeHart cannot carry with this Cindy character. There's no chance. Uh, Listen, I would agree she's a little bit out of his league, and I feel like because of his advanced age, he's at a legit heart attack risk here. But I I agree. I feel like this is one of the most sexual films we have watched together, and it is not what I was expecting. It is deeply erotic, I admit. And again, this is what you wanted. Hey, speaking of wanting things, Normad wants Cindy eliminated, or at least he does once a couple of his goons tell him they saw her around town. The one dude has a massive scar over his eye, which, did he always have that, or? Uh, I mean, they drew in the line much deeper at this point in the movie, but there was always a little bit of a... It's not super realistic. Oh, God, it's awful. It looks Mm. fake as fuck. Either way, they head back to the only bar in town and press the bartender for some information on where Cindy is. Now, she doesn't want to tell them, so they drag her over the bar and, like, rape her? Yeah, I don't, this, I don't know why I said like. They literally rape yeah, her. Yeah, this is a rough yeah. scene where the, like, cultists, the Satan people, which none of this holds up, sort of rape the bartender trying to get access to Cindy and Rick. It is a kind of uncomfortable scene, surprisingly graphic. But luckily, as we find out next, Justice is coming for Normad, and Justice's name is Rick. They take off on a motorcycle here, right? They we, we get a yeah, helmet. Him and on. Cindy, yeah. Him and Cindy get get the helmets on. Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, Rick no, sorry. gets a helmet on. Cindy does not get a helmet on. She's sort of carrying something that looks like a purse that turns into a helmet that transitions from not a helmet to a helmet, and then she's dead. Oh, this is the most confusing and poorly edited scene in this whole movie. She does not have a helmet when they leave, but then in some shots she has one and it's gone again. Also, uh, these guys are chasing them. But they never actually catch them, and they aren't shooting at them. But then suddenly the goon's car, like, stops, and they're like, we got her. And both of us were like, what? We actually rewound it because it was so fucked up. Was there supposed to be a moment where they shot her or stopped her or something? And she seemed dead, but I don't understand what's happening No, suddenly we just get a cut to Rick's bike on the ground, and Cindy lying on there, bloody, and she's dead. (laughs) Dead. Dead. Legit. <laughs> like, we cut to her yeah. fucking funeral. What is yeah. going on here? Yeah, so we're, we transition to a funeral, and they are saying goodbye to her. There's flowers, and there's a pastor. And we I don't understand how quickly we got from, like, Rick and Cindy being the heroes to Cindy being dead. I'm hoping we're getting a MacGruber here. Like, I'm like, what are, what's, what's <laughs> going to happen? Are we going to have Rick then, like, have sex with her ghost corpse and think they're going to go well? <laughs> No, I mean, that's not quite how he handles this, but I'll tell you how he does handle it. By hitting the old heavy bag, which he does uh, semi-angrily, until Huck shows up with this Native American mannequin to, I don't know, motivate Rick to get revenge? I'm completely lost here. I don't know, I, I don't know. It's fucked up. We got heavy bag. We got a strange indigenous, like, mannequin, and now we're going to transition to Rick getting his revenge. Yeah, I mean, I guess whatever Huck did, it worked. As the next time we see Rick, he's stalking up to Normad's house, armed with a bow and arrow, which he quickly uses to take out one of the armed guards patrolling the property. And why stop there? He takes another one out via arrow to the back and then snaps a different one's neck in the least believable way possible. Oh, my God. This sequence? (laughs) I don't know, man. This is is bad. Oh, my God. 
God. This fucking transition to a camera of a shadow picture of him breaking a neck is one of the most laughable things I've seen in a movie in my entire life. Um, It is so, so bad. We have this strange scene where our big bad Normad is meeting with one of his, like, drug cartel people. And we know that Rick is coming to, like, intervene in where this is happening. So... Things are not going good for Normad here. Rick's coming for his revenge. He did not feel okay with Cindy being taken down here. No, definitely. As you mentioned, Normad is meeting with a, I think, Mexican drug dealer uh, while all this is happening. But after this guy dares to speak Spanish in the phone, Normad kills him and his lady. And then Rick busts in to settle the score. They appear to be standing in the middle of an empty room or, like, purgatory. There is nothing behind them. Yeah, so... It's really dark. Rick seems to get the jump on Normad, but then we get some of those satanic cultists slash goons pop out afterwards. And it's clear that we're in the temple where that ritual went on earlier in our movie here. And Rick seems like he's in trouble. How's this going to work out for our uh, writer, director, songwriter, (laughs) and main character of our film? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a trap for sure. But... Uh, It turns out that when the Normad's goons take him outside to kill him, that's also a trap as uh, Huck is waiting to get the drop on them for revenge. Reverse. Oh, shit. So the people who were supporting the evil character are gone, and Rick's going in to finish this with the big bad Normad. We're going to see what happens here. What's the satanic cult leader slash drug dealer slash police officer slash judge slash old man with a deep (laughs) voice going to do? I don't even think he knows me. He's very caught off guard by Rick reappearing here. It's me again. You're the kind of puke that makes the world decay. Huh? (laughs) Anyway, Normad tries to cut a deal with them. He's got enough coke to make them both rich, but Rick is not having it. And after a hilariously low-budget scuffle, Rick manages to jam a knife into his torso, thus ending this once and for all. Still, it's uh, too bad about Cindy, though, right? Oh, man. (laughs) Fucking Cindy was the thing carrying this film. We transitioned to Rick, and he's at the grave of Cindy. He's got some flowers there. He's setting it up. And then the nun from earlier in the movie shows up here. Kind of hot nun shows up to talk to him. This part was so fucking confusing. I guess because her life was in danger, the nuns running that hospital from earlier decided they had to hide her but pretend she was dead and hold hold a funeral to throw them off the trail? What? Why? What is happening here? Well, we knew that the satanic cult was kind of embedded with the police. And if we did not throw out a funeral there, they would still be after Cindy. Cindy was the one who saw them sacrifice that child. And they were not willing to let her go free. They needed her to be out of the way. I mean, I guess. But this still seems like a very far way to go. Uh, Did you hear the soundtrack to this movie? It's John DeHart. Just John DeHart yeah. just wrote all of this. And he sang while he f- attractive women in the film (laughs) so i don't know about you but i'm not gonna question where this plot went fair enough so we get a happy ending but only 30 seconds of one uh cindy quickly explains what happens they hug and then bam we are in the credits and these credits don't fuck around either they are done in like 10 seconds but i guess it's easy when you can literally just say everything john (laughs) dehart done god damn (laughs) Yeah, these credits were as fast as I thought a 70-year-old would be with a 30-year-old sexy woman. (laughs) Here we are. We've run through the credits, and now we're going to be heading out towards how we feel about this movie. Yeah, you want to just go right into our ratings? I mean, this is our, we've already spent more time talking about this than they spent fucking writing this thing, so should we just get into it? I think we absolutely should. There's no way right, we need well. to give it any more credit than it has <laughs> earned. Yeah, for sure. So we are going to slide into our ratings now. The way that we always do this, we're going to be on a scale of 1 to 10 two times. 1 to 10 for how bad it is, 1 to 10 for how enjoyable, and the goal is to find movies that are a 10 out of 10 on both scales, or what we call a crit 20. Uh, and I will say, I think you'll agree with me, this is 100% a movie that is 10 or a 10 bad. So this is in play for both of us, I would assume. This is the easiest 10 bad I think I have ever given on a movie in this podcast. <laughs> that is saying a lot. We've watched a lot of things here. 
But this was almost instantly a 10 bat. It took about 43 seconds to decide where we were. It took the first John DeHart scene to decide this was a 10 bat. This is like someone dared their dad to star in a movie. John DeHart, and I'm not exaggerating, is maybe the most untalented person they've ever seen. (laughs) From an acting standpoint, <laughs> yeah. songwriting how aside, you? how yeah. dare you? How dare you besmirch the good goddamn name of John DeHart? Uh, I'll tell you how. His facial expressions, I cannot even describe them. He's got dead eyes. We already mentioned that. But just like in general, zero emotion. Like if you told me he was an alien that just came to Earth and was trying to approximate human interactions, I think I would believe you. <laughs> like that's more believable than the idea that anyone could be this bad at acting. He was horrible. I don't know if it was the camera on him or what it was, but John DeHart is, I don't know if I can. He's the worst. He might be the worst actor we've seen in any movie. It's very possible. And And he stars in this movie. He wrote it. He directed it. He started. I'm not going to say he's the worst singer, though, because there's something to the The song that he produced here. (laughs) And we're going to talk about that. I absolutely agree. You didn't throw out your number there. You, it's 10. It's, it's a 10, 100. Right? Dude, I think they had about 45 minutes of actual story here, and they were like, let's just talk slowly and improvise until we double it. Here's like, my 10. Here's my 10. Yeah. Acting, plot, sound, editing, continuity, music, John DeHart. Yeah. No, listen, I, I agree completely. We're totally in agreement on this. What little story there was in this movie goes completely off the rails after the hour mark. Like, stuff just stops making sense, and everything is just falling apart here. This is 100% 10 bad. Good God. <laughs> We're about to get the very difficult part, though, where we say how enjoyable this whole situation was. I will admit, this is the hardest part for me. For you, how enjoyable is this on a scale of 1 to 10? I have had a lot of fun talking about and had a lot of fun watching this. We have drank a whole fuck ton of bourbon and Miller High Life, and things are a bit out of control here. Um, when I look back for enjoyability, I laughed a fucking metric shit ton, and most of that is because John DeHart acting is so bad. Yeah. Just absolutely bad. The, it's atrocious. The writing is awful. But there were also scenes here that I really enjoyed. We talked about <laughs> We talked about who was the best at doing the one man project. And we compared this to Rudy Ray Moore and YK Kim. Yes. So I feel like YK Kim is significantly better at action. Yes. Like the action in this movie, I would say, is it's biggest well, detriment dude, John it's John DeHart awful. can barely fucking move. Yeah, it's awful. He and all he of might this, as well be on a walker out there. The sounds they put into the combat were fucking terrible and it was not believable. I would say Rudy Ray Moore has a better both comedy and yeah. action sensibility. He's the man. He is the man. Rudy I, Ray Moore consensus number one. I would put him at the top for sure. But what I say that John DeHart dominated on is both the sex scenes and the romance created by his soundtrack. I have never seen someone create a soundtrack like this. And so it was really, really funny. I really enjoyed the way that he went there. I went 10 bad for him. I can't do 10 in oh, I know shit. it's close. That's fine. But I had to have this at an 8. I couldn't quite put it at the 10 in That's fair. There was just too much missing, and I was too confused, and the acting was so bad. I don't know. If there was slightly more Cindy, slightly more singing. <laughs> they um, couldn't squeeze in much more Cindy. I know. They didn't put lot. her in there a lot. And if there was a little bit more, I might have been able to go to that crit 20. But I had to sit this at an 8. So that's still a really high score for me. That is, yeah. I, I enjoyed watching it but yeah. i couldn't quite get there that's totally fair i am right there with you i also cannot give this a 10 for enjoyable although like part of me wants to on a fundamental level because this is exactly the kind of nonsensical low budget movie that i feel like should fit that rating but my biggest problem with this is the fact that many of the scenes just go so fucking long like i get what they're going for here they want to hit the 90 minute mark i would almost prefer if they brought this thing in at like 80 and just cut multiple minutes from many scenes uh i don't know in a weird way i think the best and worst parts of this movie might be the soundtrack (laughs) listen the music is awful but the fact that every song is performed by john dehart and or the one who plays cindy is like incredibly hilarious the act is atrocious (laughs) but there's a lot there's a lot to laugh at like the fact that john dehart i think you mentioned earlier he has the fucking balls to go out there and be like not only am i an accomplished singer 
I'm a leading man in movies. Come on, dude. He's so bad. It's he's a great. bit of a hero of mine at this point, based on the like amount of balls he's shown in to pull this off. I can't <laughs> believe that he went for this because it does not transition. It does not come across. No, my God, no. The fact that he was like, listen, uh, actress who plays Cindy, this is going to be a seven-minute sex scene where you fucking ride me in a bathtub full of bubble bath. Like, come on. <laughs> It's a good I'm movie. giving that a 10 out of no, 10 scene. Good, I good, will tell you that. Uh, whoever scene. played Cindy in this, I hope that she's had a very fulfilling life because she deserves it. Uh, well, after suffering through this, for sure. So I can't give this a 10 because, again, some scenes just fucking dragged. But for the sheer nonsensicalness of this whole thing and the fact that the whole time you and I both were like, what the fuck is going on? We're laughing. We're fucking dying. I have this as a 9 enjoyable. <laughs> Like, I can't explain this. That's so close. That is a it 19 is. out of 20. Close. I, I mean, again, I think this really is. When we talked about it in this podcast in the first place, these are exactly the kind of movies I thought of. How about fucking Vinegar Syndrome putting this out? Oh, they are They're so fucking fantastic, great. Yeah. right? Like, absolutely one of the best out there. And if there's any way we could connect them, we would. Like, they are so, so good. I would say the best out there. In I agree. Terms of- I agree. And I think that's fantastic. How about the Miller High Life and the Bullet Bourbon that we chugged? down here i mean i've said it before i'll say it again mineral high life is my favorite beer it's delicious i would drink these every day if i could the bullet bourbon uh it was smooth it was smoothish i was fine i was shocked at how easy that was to take down i'm down all of my miller high life i'm down my bourbon that fucking boiler maker we took down was delicious and i was done it kind of was the right thing to set the tone for this movie the boiler maker put me in a really good place the subsequent uh, glass of straight bourbon is the reason why I'm slurring a lot right now. I'm very drunk. The Miller High Life was a nice kind of capper on it, but uh, yeah, the bourbon kind of fucked me up a little. Oh, that's good. So what are we going to be sharing with people next week? Well, next week, we actually, it's funny. This movie was a suggestion from, again, I am Hash Brown on Instagram. We appreciate them. Thank, Thank you, you Hash Brown. Definitely. Next week, we have a straight up audience request. We are going to be watching a horror movie from the early 2010s called beneath have you heard of this <laughs> no yeah i hadn't heard of it either apparently it is a a bunch of teenagers celebrating the end of high school go to a cabin like on a lake to party and shit just goes horribly wrong mm, i'm thinking jason kind of as kind of stuff i don't know if it's uh, along the lines of it's not like a slasher per se i believe they are confronted by some sort of like demonic sea creature oh jaws-esque i, I think we'll get some jaws vibes for sure Straight up request, uh, and I'm very happy that we're going to fulfill that. Should be a good time. We've had a lot of fun with the horror genre in general. Ooh, I'm really excited. I love that shit right now. That's right up my alley. There you go. Well, you'll want to join us next week for that one. Before then, if you have not already, please follow us on social media at the BMB Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to send us emails, the BMB Podcast at gmail.com. Definitely. We always love to hear from you. That's uh, how we get some of our audience requests, and we hope there's more coming. And, uh, you know, join us next week for Beneath. Until then, I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep on following the heart. What? <laughs> it was like an homage to follow your heart. I, I got it. But his name is the heart. Will justice win out over evil? 